I'm, my name is Javier Jorquera, and I'm very honored to be here with all of you in the second session of the event titled Electric Vehicle Total Cost of Ownership and Grid Integration Tools, which we are very happy to co organize with the Asia Development Bank. So, this session, as I mentioned previously, will focus on EV charging. Um, so, uh, after some opening remarks by both James Leder from the ADD and then Per Videl from the IA, I will continue to present some work with done at the IA on the topic of EV charging, uh, followed by a Q&A to answer all, the, all of the questions you may have uh, on the tool I will present or also on the other slides I will present. So just as a notice, before we begin, um, this uh, session is being recorded and it will be, be made available in the IA website later in the event page we have created for this session. Um, and also, please, if you have any question, uh, type it in the Q&A. But if it's the case that during my presentation you are completely lost and you feel like you need to ask a question to continue understanding the rest of the presentation, please feel free to raise your hand and we will get back to you as soon as we see it. So with that, I will now continue to pass the floor to our dear guests, which will give the opening remarks today. So first, I would like to hand the floor over to James Leather. James is a director of the transport in the transport sector office at the Asia Development Bank. Please say, James, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Um, it's great to be collaborating between ADB and the International Energy Agency, IEA. Uh, we, what we, the purpose of these workshops is to showcase the practical and insightful tools for supporting e-mobility deployment. There is a lot of interest around this area. Uh, there's a lot of complexity around this area. Um, and it's particularly important in the Asian region, given the dominance of particularly the two, three wheelers vehicles, but we need to look at the whole remit of transport. So it, 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 it's with that background that we are very happy to collaborate with IEA on this. Um, this workshop is presented under the e-mobility support and innovation investment platform, sorry, which is financed by the GEF, the Global en uh, Environmental Facility. And that the purpose of the platform is to bring together and coordinate governments, development organizations, private sector financiers, and experts in the field to understand exactly what are the requirements. And we'll hear much more about that. This is the second uh, week of these workshops. Um, in last week's sessions, we focused on the total cost of ownership of e-vehicles. And today we will hear more on the impact of EV charging on the energy grid. So looking at that complexity between transport and energy and the requirements within those. Again, it's a complex area, but we must see joint collaboration uh, to, to look at how we do this. And any policies that set, it be that in climate change or in energy and transport, they must all be joined up. And the kind of tools that will be presented today and were presented last week, greatly enhance our ability to have dialogue with governments across the region to make sure we are speaking with one voice in a joint and coherent way across the various mine agencies. So it's, it, 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 it's very good to collaborate on these areas. It's very good to enhance the available knowledge, the expertise and the experience that we can share across there. One final point I'd like to raise, we will be putting a link in the chat box to a needs assessment survey to try and ensure we provide the best service possible in these areas. So if you do see uh, in the chat box, that will pop up. But once again, thank you very much for, for joining us. And let's, I would now like to hand back to Per, I believe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. And uh, from our side too at IA, it's a great pleasure, of course, to have this opportunity to organize, to co-organize this event uh, with ADB within the framework of the Jeff funded Global e-mobility program. Um, yeah, collaboration is the word, building knowledge uh, is another important area. And of course, speaking to many of you, taking that knowledge into practice uh, is of course a part of the purpose of uh, today's event, but also the continued discussion we're having within JEF funded uh, Global E-Mobility Program. We at IA, uh, we of course, uh, we are data driven. Uh, we focus mainly on uh, building uh, scenarios for the future, looking at the, the the information and data we can get. Uh, on, the, on the electrical vehicle side, we have the Global EV Outlook, which is an annual publication coming up every year in Ocean Track. 
um, markets, technologies, uh, policies, etc. Uh, this is also accompanied with the database. We can find uh, data on both the policies and uh, the, the data we have as well, all for free. Um, but it's, this work also goes into other uh, analysis, such as the, the, the things we do in supply chains, like cleantech manufacturing, uh, the different the roadmap we do for seeing how the world can lead, go to net zero emissions. So our analysis is usually important for us when it comes to EVs and the transport sector. And that's why also we see great value to be part of this uh, program and this discussion here today with you, because many of you might have information and data from countries in areas where we don't have outreach today. So that's why our role now for the, the JEP program is certainly helpful for us to build those relationships. And we think it's a two-side win. We get the, the chance to build, uh, help build global knowledge, uh, but it's an opportunity for you as well to get access to some of the analysis that hopefully can also help you in your internal processes in your countries. Uh, so if you want to be on our, our kind of ongoing mailing list, don't hesitate. Uh, I'll send you the, our contact email in the chat later. But then coming to the very important topic of today, which is indeed charging infrastructure. And that angle, as you said, Jamie, linked to also the ensuring grid capacity and planning. And this is not a challenge only for a few selected countries. This is one of the challenges we see in many countries of how to get it right, both when it comes to the planning side, um, how to ensure that you from a government side have a whole of government approach um, to make sure that um, different departments responsible, different part of the, the value chain can also talk to each other. But it's also important uh, for ensuring that grid capacity, as I said. Uh, so when we talk to members of the electrical vehicle initiative, uh, they also, many of them stress this as a challenge. They might have different approaches to it. If it's how to find the, the best approach to find where the, the right locations for the charging stations, both when it comes to uh, meeting consumer needs, but also of course uh, related to, as I said, is grid connections. And we know that if there's no grid connection in place, it can take many years. And yes, this is a challenge, challenge of course. A uh, big challenge for many governments is as well, of course, the lack of staff, personnel to work on the EV ecosystem, uh, challenges related to uh, what to do and how to uh, strengthen non-public charging. Uh, the business cases for EV charging is also not uh, clear in all countries today, of course, payment mapping, charging speeds, reliability and accessibility. Um, so it's a very important topic, which we, we see that uh, we should use any opportunity to have to also discuss and facilitate that knowledge and experience exchange uh, with uh, between different stakeholders. So I will hand over now to uh, Javier. And uh, again, I want to thank, thank him, uh, our colleagues at ADB, and also Jason for all the preparations of this work. And I hope you get a chance to ask many questions uh, today, uh, but also see as a stepwise approach where we happy to follow up later as well um, to have further discussions. And again, uh, we are again very keen to hear uh, from you as well, what challenges you see in, in different countries uh, in the Asia Pacific region. So thank you very much again. And I hand back now to you, Javier, for uh, taking us through this great presentation. Thank you very much, Per, and thank you very much, James. Uh, for those of you who maybe were not here last week, uh, Per uh, Anders Videl is the IA's Jeff 7 program coordinator, and, and he's also part of the Energy Technology Policy Division at the IA. I would also, before going to my presentation, like to thank uh, all of the ADB colleagues that have been organizing this with us, including, of course, James, but also Johanna and Pamela, who is, I think, not here in joining the webinar today. So with that, uh, I will now continue with my presentation. And as I was saying, please, if you have any question that is really uh, making you lose the, the flow of the presentation and you feel very lost, uh, feel free to raise your hand and we will get back to you as soon as we, as we see it, okay? So now I will begin to share my slides. Okay, do you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay, thank you, and let's begin. So, as I was saying previously, today the focus is uh, on specifically on a tool uh, and on the topic of electric vehicle charging. And I will use my presentation, the acronym EB for electric vehicles, for your information. So, today, as I, present, I prepared this in, in, here in the outline of the presentation, uh, I will first talk 
in a more general way about reintegration of electric vehicles or EVs. Then I will do a, a special focus on the EV charging and reintegration tool that we developed at the IA under the JEF program. And then uh, I will hold the Q&A session with all of you to answer all of the questions you may have on this lecture presented or also in the tool that I will do a live demo. So allow me to begin setting a scene by talking about the electricity demand pro prospects we have in our IA analysis. What we see here is that electricity demand and, uh, and also the faster charging in particular are set to grow substantially at least out to 2030. And of course, this could extend beyond 2030. What we see here is that today, according to the global electric vehicle, vehicle outlook that Per already mentioned, the electricity uh, electric vehicle charging demand uh, accounts for 110 terawatt hours uh, today, which is roughly, to give you an idea, the power demand of the Netherlands on, on an annual basis. This is important to highlight because this is already becoming significant at a global level. And according to our scenario analysis, uh, this demand by 2030 could grow to reach up to 1,700 terawatt hours uh, in 2030 in our net zero scenario, uh, which is that, that, that level would be almost uh, three times the demand of Korea today. So it would be a really massive increase and a massive level of electricity demand at a global level by 2030 in that specific scenario. This growth is explained by several factors, such as lower cost of ownership uh, of the electric vehicles versus internal combustion engine vehicles, but also because of several other aspects, such as government policies, uh, including, for example, subsidies or uh, tax reliefs. What does this mean for the power system? This means, on one hand, increased needs for electricity supply for the power system, uh, not only uh, due to higher demand overall on an annual basis, but also because, compared to what we see today, the structure of that demand will change. This is because uh, larger vehicles, such as, for example, buses and trucks, uh, are expected to be deployed at larger scale than what, what we see today. And uh, this means that, in most cases, these vehicles will use faster charging. So this will change, in a fundamental way, um, the structure of the electricity demand used for EV charging. These vehicles, as I was saying, buses and trucks, could account for over a third of EV charging demand by 2030, and could put additional stress on the power system due to their higher charging power requirements. So what is, uh, in practice, uh, the impacts that, that this growth in demand could cause to the power system? We see that the impacts relate to several factors. This is mainly, for example, uh, on the first point, on the time, meaning when the charging takes place and for how long. Second, the location, if it's in a distribution grid that is maybe already saturated and has little hosting capacity, or maybe alternatively in a grid that has a lot of extra capacity that can host new uh, electric vehicles pretty well. And also it depends on the charging power that is being utilized. For example, if it's a slow charger with, uh, for example, uh, five kilowatts instead of maybe a super fast charger, which in the case of trucks could reach almost up to four megawatts. So the difference can vary significantly. So depending on the all of these three factors, we see that different charging locations and charging schemes can have different impacts on the power system. For example, if we see the chart on the left, a low impact would be work charging because normally um, the people there leave their car for several hours. So there is a flexibility opportunity there because they, what we call the charging window, namely the time that the vehicle spends there in the charging location is normally long. So that means that they, they can charge at a lower uh, power than in other parts and thus the impact on the power system can be lower than in other parts. But uh, in contrast, for example, if we think of unroot charging, for example, if we think of a highway where the cars just stop for as little time as possible, there normally the power tends to be higher. So that would cause a higher impact on the power grid. First, uh, because the, the, the charging power could be higher and this could be meaning more stress for the power uh, system. At the same time, we really would like to highlight that these grid integration challenges can be turned into opportunities for the power system is if what we call managed or smarter, more flexible charging is available. So for example, in the case of Android charging, because the charging window is 
not too long, it's not too much time in which the user uh, wants to stay there, uh, as uh, he or she would like to leave normally as soon as possible. But in the case of, for example, home charging, where normally users tend to leave their car there up to 12 hours, there, the flexibility opportunity because of the duration of stay um, is really present and it can be utilized to ensure that the grid integration of electric vehicles happens in the best way possible. So what we see is that charging flexibility is really essential to lower system costs and emissions. And this is why we, in our reports, we will really push uh, that the government should, if possible, try to find a way to implement smarter ways of charging to make the most out of the benefits of electric vehicle charging schemes. So how does this help? Essentially because smart charging can uh, reduce system costs and integrate more variable renewables by shifting part of the EV charging load in time. For example, here on the left side chart, we see that in a simulation we did for our report in 2021 uh, for the Korean scenario in 2035, there we see that uh, if you see the dark blue uh, line, which is related to unmanaged charging, um, if we use smart charging, which could be the line uh, on, on green, the charging pattern can follow the renewable output more closely, and therefore this can enable a significant reductions in both peak costs of the power system, operating costs in total, uh, but also on emissions, because the load can be shifted to where uh, the renewable output is at, at its highest. Further, B2G, what is called a bidirectional vehicle to grid charging, which means that not only the out the, the charging that is uh, taken out from the grid can be modulated, but also in some cases the vehicle can provide power back to the grid. This can provide further benefits in terms of uh, flexibility and also in terms of renewable integration. For example, if that extra electricity is stored during the daytimes in case of a high solar PV output. Then that extra uh, and that uh, battery can, can, can work as a, a grid asset and give back some of that power when the system, in some cases, more uh, mostly needs it in peak uh, demand hours, for example, at 7 p.m. So now I will discuss a bit on policies we and, and our work on that topic. A key message I would like to give uh, first is that we believe that effective but also coordinated action is needed to integrate EVs successfully at scale. And I would like to emphasize the coordinated because although normally the IA will focus on giving policy recommendations, so aim mostly at policymakers, this is such a big challenge that it really needs to have not only policymakers involved, but every stakeholder in the whole value chain of the EV ecosystem involved. This includes uh, policymakers, as I was saying, but also, of course, it includes the utilities, the transport sector uh, people, um, final project developers, academics, everyone should be involved to ensure that this a large transition to electric mobility is done in the best way possible. So for that, we developed a, in a report called Grid Integration of Electric Vehicles that was published last year in December, four key steps for policymakers to successfully integrate electric vehicles. The first one would be to prepare institutions for the electric mobility transition. At first, this means that policymakers should engage with electric mobility stakeholders on all of the possible aspects as I was saying, this can include academics, other project developers, uh, utilities, and so on. But also, not only should they engage uh, separately with them, but also they should break silos in planning and policy making. For example, by creating joint offices of the transportation uh, and the urban planning and the energy sectors, so that because of this the ecosystem, we need input from all of them. It's pretty important to ensure that the coordination across all of these sectors is done in the best way possible. Second, we recommend the policymakers to really uh, carry out a deep assessment of the power system impacts. This, uh, right, so first, defining an electric mobility strategy, where, for example, you could think of setting some targets or at least projecting some scenarios of what uh, electric mobility, mobility uptake you could see in, in the country. The second point would be uh, to gather data and develop insights, for example, by the um, collecting data on the EV charging sessions, uh, tr tracking the movement of vehicles, for example, to understand the driving patterns and their arrival times and departure times from their normal resting spots. Uh, all of this data can really be helpful, helpful to develop insights and thus make the 
assessment of our system impacts better. And the third point would be to combining all of that targets you may have set in the strategy and also the data you have collected and the insects you have gained to assess the grid impacts under certain mobility scenarios to plan for the most robust power system possible and also to coordinate the EV charging infrastructure appropriately. The third point would be to deploy measures for grid integration. At first, uh, the first point would be here to that we recommend to accommodate all charging solutions, meaning that it's better to have a charging infrastructure than none at all. Uh, but whenever possible, we recommend policymakers to encourage managed charging uh, through several options uh, of policies, for example, tariffs or incentives, uh, subsidies, and many others. The second one would be to facilitate aggregation by enforcing standards and interoperability to ensure that, for example, the vehicles can charge in different charging spots. Uh, the third one would be to value the flexibility of electric vehicles, for example, through tariff design, for example, time of use, uh, tariffs that uh, can give more value uh, to the flexibility provided by electric vehicles. Um, the fourth one would be to coordinate EV charging with renewables. This can be done, for example, by incentivizing daytime charging in the workplace, as normally uh, that correlates quite well with the solar output. So that way you can coordinate, as I was saying, the EV charging with the renewable output. And fifth would, would be to incentivize smart readiness. For example, this can be done through um, ensuring minimum communication protocols that the infrastructure has to have available in order for the uh, smart charging to be carried out at some point later. The last point we recommend is to improve planning practices. This has to do, for example, with uh, carrying out proactive uh, planning. So try to really assess where um, the uh, extra capacity upgrades in the network could be needed and do them proactively. And also the second point would be to reflect the full value of EV charging. This uh, relates, for example, considering uh, how EV charging can um, help your uh, expansion planning, for example, in the case of transmission uh, and distribution networks. So today, uh, because of the focus on the session, I will mostly focus to, on talking on the power system impacts, but also on how to make this grid integration uh, better. I will now go with this point. So what is really important is to really assess and plan uh, for the minimization of the power system impacts and to unlock the, in the best way possible, the opportunities provided by EV charging, it's really important to assess two aspects. One is the current status um, of the electric vehicle fleet in your uh, respective countries, but also then assess how it could evolve over time. Here I, uh, we have a chart that shows the estimated stock share of all vehicles. On the left, for example, we see that in Vietnam, uh, a large share of the vehicles are two wheelers, uh, whereas for example in Japan the share is lower. Um, and on the right hand side, we see uh, a chart that provides the same information but only for the electric vehicle fleets uh, of vehicles, so excluding all of the gasoline and diesel vehicles, for example. What can you take out of this slide? So on the right hand side, you can observe. Uh, uh, policymakers can have an idea of what is the current status of the electric uh, vehicle fleet. So with that, uh, if that information, information can be used to design the best policies and the measures for today, if they are needed, if, for example, if they are having already some issues uh, with some the uh, transformers in some distribution um, network uh, areas, for example. But also looking at the complete vehicle fleet, you can have an idea of how the, the electric vehicle fleet could evolve over time. So this, both pieces of information, both the current, the, the today's EV fleet, but also the outlook that we expect to have for the electric vehicles over time, are both really essential pieces of information to plan for the best uh, EV charging strategies and infrastructure deployment possible. So we have some recommendations on this aspect for assessing power system impacts. The first one uh, would be to develop mobility scenarios. This includes, for example, uh, in some cases, the transmission system operator, such as uh, APTE in France, uh, develop mobility scenarios to try to assess uh, how their uh, infrastructure upgrade needs would evolve over time because of the uh, EV uh, deployment. 
but also by a national laboratory, for example, on a more research-oriented focus, uh, such as in the case of the United States. To directly linked to what I was saying about governing data and insights, uh, we see at least three aspects. One would be to develop public surveys, for example, those uh, that are carried out in Chile and Thailand. This allows policymakers and whoever is interested on the topic to understand what are the uh, driving patterns, for example, from where to where drivers move uh, by type of vehicle, namely, for example, trucks, uh, motorbikes, um, cars, and so on. This can be really useful to assess where, for example, the charging needs may arise and then to plan accordingly for that. But also it could be really useful, for example, to understand the arrival and the parcel times, and this can be beneficial to design policies that accurately reflect the driving patterns and behaviors of the users in this in, in every jurisdiction. The second aspect would be if it's also possible to go beyond service and also deploy digital technologies such as GPS systems to really follow and monitor with a high time resolution where the vehicles are moving and thus to understand their driving patterns better. And then the third point, what you also can do is to record charging sessions and make the data open access, such as what, what they have done in Germany in, in public tenders. Now the other aspect I will uh, focus on is and which measures can be deployed for grid integration. So for that, we provide a framework for grid integration of electric vehicles. Um, that is not thought of a completely linear path, but it's thought of more of an idea on how to support policymakers to assess which measures could be more apparent to deploy, depending on the uh, level of uptake uh, and the impacts that the EVs are causing in their own uh, power system in their jurisdiction. So, we begin with phase one. Phase one is a phase in which the power system, the power system would not see a noticeable impact because of EV charging. So in this case, uh, this is the case of most countries today. Um, and in this case, what we recommend is to encourage higher electric vehicle update, uptake through incentives and through the deployment of public charging infrastructure. For example, a measure of this could be to proactively coordinate for charging station deployment in areas that could be beneficial to the grid. A second phase would be when a power system is already beginning uh, to see a noticeable uh, EV charging load, but at the same time, the power system may not yet have a high demand for power system flexibility. So this is the case, for example, in Norway, and you may be surprised at this because Norway has a very high electric vehicle uptake but the thing is that in the case of Norway, at least in this particular example, because of the high availability of hydropower electricity in Norway, they don't have very big flexibility needs. So although the electric vehicle load can already be significant, then um, because the flexibility demand uh, is not too high, um, this doesn't yet require that many advanced measures that we could maybe see in different systems which do have uh, higher uh, needs for flexibility. So in such a case, such as what we find in Norway, uh, we recommend to implement some uh, passive measures, such as, for example, time of use tariffs, which are deployed in that country. Um, and that could be a, a very effective way to ensure that the, uh, the electric vehicle charging is integrated smoothly into the power system. The third phase would be when the flexible electric vehicle load is significant, uh, and at the same time, there is high flexibility demand. So, uh, for example, this is what we find in some cases, uh, uh, such as in France, in Netherlands, and in the US, where the electric vehicle um, uptake is significant, and at the same time, the power system is also in need of flexibility. So in this case, as more flexibility could be needed, uh, we recommend a bit more advanced measures, such as what we call active measures. Uh, one of the examples is unidirectional D1G, or d to grid which means that depending on a signal that the power system can send to the charging infrastructure, uh, which is directly tied to the demand of the power system in that moment, then the charging of the electric vehicles can be modified to try to minimize the impact of their charging demand in the power system uh, to avoid the power system impacts that I was discussing. And the last phase would be a phase in which flexible EV load demand is highly available 
the, and also the at the same time the flexibility demand is high. So this is a case that is normally particular of island power systems. Um, for example, you could think of the Azores Islands in Portugal or in Hawaii, in the in the islands of Hawaii. Um, and in these cases, uh, because for example, some of the technologies for smart charging have been in place, such as bidirectional uh, B2 to grid, which is when not only the charging can be modulated, but also the vehicles themselves can provide power back to the grid. Uh, this uh, phase uh, means that that extra availability of flexibility plus the option to give back power to the grid from electric vehicles um, can really ensure that the system costs uh, and the emissions remain as low as possible if the measures uh, such as bidirectional uh, charging, BTG, are deployed uh, in time. Okay, so now uh, I will continue with the tool. Uh, here you can see uh, both the QR code and the link for the tool I will present, but also here um, I will send this presentation later and we will post it in the IA's website event page. You can also check in more detail the report uh, I, I was talking about, which is a report uh, that is a policy manual for the integration of electric vehicles. Okay. So I see Jason uh, kind of already put the link. I will continue. But as I was saying, please, if you have any question, feel free to raise your hand and we will get back to you shortly. Okay. So now we'll focus on presenting the, the IA's EV charging and grid integration. So this tool has three main motivations. The first one is to assess the impact of EV charging on the power system. The second is to assess the effect of measures for mitigating EV charging impacts. And here it's mostly about what we call managed or smart charging. And third, it's to estimate the CO2 emissions related to EV charging so that policymakers, utility professionals, academics, and, and so on can, for example, compare different measures and see what their outcomes could be uh, on the emissions of the power system that can be directly related to electric vehicle charging. So the first model to assess the impact of EV charging on the power system, it provides a simulation of EV charging behavior, and its main output is the weekly EV charging demand profile on a five-minute resolution basis. The second one uh, would be, uh, the output would be essentially similar. So it's also a weekly EV charging demand profile, but here you can have implemented some managed charging measures, and then you can compare with the unmanaged case, what are the differences and what are the, maybe the benefits of certain um, charging schemes, such as time of use tariffs and B1B. The third one, based on a simplified representation of the electricity mix of your own jurisdiction, which you can modify in the tool. It provides a calculation of yearly CO2 emissions for you to be able to assess differences across different scenarios and measures, which can help decide which measure could be the best to implement depending on the local context of the jurisdiction. So this is, and I will begin by showing the main output. So let you know where I'm heading, and then I will show you how to create such simulations with the tool. So the main output of this tool, as I was saying, is a weekly electricity demand profile, uh, which is showing which electricity demand is caused directly by EV charging. The charging power can be analyzed in five minute intervals, so it has a high time resolution. And the user can also check the results by different charging locations. And also for each of the fleets, like you can define uh, for the simulation. This information that we provide, and on the, uh, I will do a live demo to show more in detail. All of these uh, options you can assess with the tool uh, can be useful to several stakeholders. And I would really emphasize this. So it's not only for policymakers, but also for many other stakeholders in the EV ecosystem. For example, first talking about policymakers uh, and utilities, in, in those cases, uh, these stakeholders could benefit from the tool to if they, for example, would like to know whether the grids or generation capacity need any upgrade to accommodate more EVs. Um, policymakers and academics, for example, can also study trade-offs between different charging schemes and between, for example, different charging infrastructure availability. Uh, and also, if you think, for example, of 
pilot project developers. The pilot project developers can use it to provide a preliminary assessment of the electricity demand curves that could be associated with the test system. And with that, they can decide and, and check if the hosting capacity in where they plan to deploy the project, of the, the pilot project of EVs, uh, is enough, or if maybe they should move elsewhere where the grid has more hosting capacity to have their uh, test uh, done. So I will now go with the motivation number one, and I will show some examples. Just one mention before going to the tool. So this tool uh, provides several options uh, for charging, for example, as, as you will know, there are several charging uh, locations that can be utilized. Uh, for example, you can have home charging and group charging, uh, which is in and group charging in the case of the highways, which is normally higher powered. You can also have workplace charging. Um, the fourth one you can also see is called depot charging, which is, for example, where you store commercial vehicles or, for example, buses, trucks. This is what we call a, a depot. Um, you can also have, for example, roadside charging, which is normally what you see in a parking spot by the street. Or you can also have what we call destination charging. And this mostly refers to, for example, when you are going to a place for a specific activity, for example, if you are going to the gym or you're going to the cinema or to the mall, um, this is what we would call destination charging because you're basically going there for a specific activity. And then as soon as you finish an activity, you Leave the text. So I will now begin with a live demo uh, um, showing a basic example of the uh, a fleet of 100 buses. Okay, do you see my screen? Okay, so before we go into the example of the buses, I would like to note that here in the tool, which we, I, we already sent the link for, you have here a, a, a full description of the technical note and a guide. So here you can read more in detail, for example, some ideas on how to use the tool and how the tool works behind the scenes. So this can be really useful if you want to understand a bit more uh, how this tool works and what you can do with it. So as I was saying, my first example would be about 100 buses. So here, and go to the first tab uh, here, which is called fleet. Uh, so here, for example, I can put a label to this uh, fleet. So I will just name it buses for simplicity reasons. Then I, you can select the vehicle type. Here you have various options, such as two wheelers, three wheelers, uh, light duty vehicles, buses or trucks. So I will select bus in this moment. Um, and then you can select the stock, which is how many of those vehicles are in this fleet you are applying. So I will just leave it at 100. So in this case, you see several other parameters. For example, the average battery capacity, the energy consumption, which is how much electricity consumes per kilometer driven, and also some driving behaviors. For example, what's the average weekday driving uh, with some variation that can be defined both for the weekdays and also for the weekends, because we know that um, the driving behaviors can vary significantly in, in some uh, fleets, depending on if it's uh, Monday to Friday or if it's uh, a weekend day. So with that, um, you can modify this according to your specific context of your jurisdiction. And here we provide some default values, uh, but if you have the information that is uh, representing adequately your local context, you can modify this as you please to make it more suitable for your own needs. So that's the fleet tab. The second tab I will show is related to the charging availability. So here, for example, um, you can see many different options you can modify, and all of them uh, have here this question mark where you can read what this parameter represents. So for example, here, you can have charging infrastructure availability of, uh, for example, uh, home depot charging, workplace charging, roadside, destination, and, and route. Uh, if you wonder uh, why this is different for weekdays and weekends, it's, it's also because this can vary significantly um, depending on the day of the week. So I think the easiest uh, example to explain this is in the workplace. So if we have cars, for example, or 
two winners. And as people don't go to work on the weekends, normally you would expect a much lower availability uh, for those vehicles uh, in the workplace on the weekend, which is here what we put in, in our uh, default values. So with this, you can modify the availability, for example, to have more or less uh, charging available for the users at the home level, at the workplace level, and, and so on and so forth. And with that, you can test various um, scenarios. But for now, I will just leave it there. Uh, and I, I will just continue to, to show the, the, the basic sample results. Uh, yes, I see there's a question there. Please, go ahead. Hi, uh, Javier. Um, I just had a doubt, actually. Um, uh, regarding the Home Depot, I had, uh, like, um, would it be different for, like, single homes and apartments, like, uh, how we set these uh, numbers based on the availability? Uh, how would we differ? How would that differ? And uh, one, uh, I had another doubt about the destination. So, uh, uh, like, uh, can you be more specific on what sort of destinations uh, like because based on where the people or uh, the like uh, the person is driving to so if it's driving to a mall uh, or suppose uh, uh, some place else so the the that would uh, vary eventually right so i just added out on that yeah uh, i will begin with the second question thanks for the for the question so the destination can be defined as for example as we can see here we can read a definition so the formal definition we put here is charging at a place of interest, for example, um, shopping mall, restaurant, public institution, uh, the gym. Uh, so, some of these places uh, are examples of what we call destination charging. And here we differentiate it from the other places. So this is a destination of a journey that is not work and not home. So why do we differentiate this? Because um, this, uh, normally these places tend to have um, different charging powers and characteristics. So for example, normally at home, you leave the car much longer, but in this case, depending on the destination, you tend to stay for two, three hours uh, at most. So that is why we made a separate uh, category for this type of charging infrastructure in our tool. Um, on the second question, I believe it was about um, how to define home charging based on the um, uh, home and apartment, right? Was it the question? Uh, yes, like uh, a single home, uh, a bungalow sort of, or uh, an, an apartment, like where there are multiple homes. Yeah. So basically, as here, we're kind of defining the, the, the parameters on kind of a fleet thinking basis. So here we cannot define, OK, this specific home has a charger of 5 kilowatts. This other one has a of 10. Like, you have to think of kind of an average or a representative um, way to simulate the fleet. So in this case, um, to, to make it more adapted to the local context, you would have to think of maybe what's the most typical charging power, for example. So uh, many places have, uh, like, for example, you can put a custom one, uh, for example, five. Five is, a, uh, I think, a rather common um, a case for home charging that is not high power. Um, but it also depends if you're, for example, doing a, like a single home charging a case, or if you're looking at like maybe a common charging place in a residential neighborhood. So all of these factors have to be accounted for. And in the end, what you modify is both the charging power. Um, and also potentially you may modify this availability if, um, I don't know, for example, people are not there on the weekend and yeah, then that, that would change. Is it okay? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Okay. sure. Okay, so I'll just like I'll reset it quickly to, to go back to the default values. Uh, I'll select here bus, the bus, bus. And leave the rest uh, the same. So here I'll just jump right into the results. So here's what we see uh, as the basic example. So you can see here the, the results by segment and by location. Here uh, I only have one segment, so basically one fleet, which is the buses. So that's why you don't see more. But if you have more fleets defined in the fleet tab, you can see up to, I think, 10. Uh, fleets and see how each of them impacts the whole uh, demand of the simulated system. So with this one, you can download the, da the data as a CSV file, which you can analyze in Excel or your prepared data analysis uh, software uh, or language uh, programming language. For example, here, um, 
you can assess with the cursor, for example, what's the charging power from this fleet. Um, let's say on Tuesday at uh, 9.25, I'll try to make this bigger, um, throughout the whole week. And you also can see several different other aspects, for just, such as, for example, the maximum EV power demand in the whole week. Uh, for example, this can be used to assess the hosting capacity needs of the test fleet you are simulating. Also, you can get the average demand. You can also, then in terms of energy, uh, estimate the weekly uh, total. And also, that can be extrapolated by the tool for the annual EV energy. So as you can see here, with this simulation, you can already see some interesting patterns and examples that can give you an idea of, uh, for example, how the fleet you are simulating could impact the, the local power system that you are defining. OK. Now I will do a, a, another example. I will do an example of cars. So I will always try to start from scratch to, to always show you how you can do this. So as I will say, at first, you go by default to the fleet tab. You go to cars, which is what we call here light duty vehicles. And I, I said I was going to do an example of 1,000. So OK. Here's the 1,000 value by default. I will leave it there, and I will not modify any of these parameters. So okay. So as you can see here, like just to give you an example, I changed here the segment to cars. And already then, the charging, the, the charging power decreased by default. And this is because. First, I will show in buses, and buses tend to have faster charging times in order to avoid being charged like, for a very long time. But in, because the batteries in cars are smaller, uh, then normally the charging power that we can have, for example, in a home uh, place is much lower. For example, here it's 3.5 kilowatts instead of the 22 that we have by default on the depot charging of the bus. Just to give that measure uh, here. So here, I will update the results. And as you see here, this is a profile of 1,000 cars uh, for charging. So for example, here, you, you can see that normally the cars uh, related demand tends to peak when people come back from work. So around 6 and, uh, 6.30 or 7, you can see normally the peak there, um, which in this case of 1,000 cars can reach almost 1 megawatt of charging demand, so it becomes significant. And then normally, the, the profile decreases after they have charged uh, during the, the, the night. And they, in some cases, increase later on during the, the day if they, for example, have workplace-based charging. So now I will show, just to illustrate that, uh, by location, uh, the charging of this uh, example. Here, for example, as I was mentioning, uh, here the light blue color relates to home charging, in this case of cars. So as we could and normally expect uh, at least uh, this tends to be higher when the cars come back to their homes. But also here on the more dark blue color, we see that there is some level of workplace charging. So in the case of cars, with the uh, base uh, default values we have for this simulation, we see that the electricity that they need is provided um, in a bigger share by home depot charging, uh, at least home char charging, sorry, which is carried out after they come back from work to their homes. But then also, while they are working, if they bring their cars to, to the work and they charge them there, this can also cause to have some level of charging um, in the case of the workplace. And, and I will also show later that, that possibly this could be increased depending on the incentives and the availability of infrastructure that uh, you may define. So now let me just do a, a change and show you what happens if you, for example, think of a, a case in which, for example, utilities or, or policymakers uh, de deploy certain measures that incentivize workplace charging uh, and thus make maybe home-based charging less attractive. So if we think of that, okay, we can go to behavior profiles. What we can do to simulate that in a certain jurisdiction, there's less home charging and more workplace charging is to basically play here with these values of the charging availability, which is somehow directly related 
to the infrastructure availability of that specific charging site. So for example, if we were to have a policy that cost the local jurisdiction to have less home charging and more workplace charging, we would then decrease this. So we would hear, for example, just as an arbitrary value, we can lower this to 30%. And then for example, we can increase here the availability uh, to 90%. So let's see how this impacts the profile. This was the base case, and as you can see, now the workplace charging takes a much higher role, in, a bigger role in the, in the charging. So previously we had, we had a, the, the pattern such as that the light blue color, so the home charging had a, the biggest peak when the people came back from the home, but now the biggest peak is because uh, of the, 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 the settings we define in the case of the workplace charging. So this would be the simulation of an example where um, there is, for any reason, uh, less availability of home charging. And because there is more, uh, instead of that, there is more workplace charging, um, then the, the charging uh, demand in the end will shift uh, as a system uh, level to the workplace. Um, and this can be also sometimes beneficial. Uh, for example, as I was showing in one of my first slides, in many jurisdictions, we can see that the solar PV uh, output can be significant. So for example, if you were to think of a way to assess and try to implement a, a way to uh, coordinate the charging with solar PV output, for example, then possibly uh, encouraging uh, uh, workplaces to have more charging infrastructure could be a good way to do it. Uh, because as you can see here in the simulation, this could be more linked to the uh, solar PV profiles in, in that case. So this can be, uh, as I was showing, a sim uh, an effective way to simulate these trade-offs between, um, for example, what, what happens to charging demand if you have predominantly home charging, or what happens if you have predominantly workplace charging, uh, to give you just an example of how this works. Now we'll go back to my slides, um, and then continue with some other examples. Okay, so what I showed before was just some examples of what we call unmanaged charging. So what does it mean? Basically, unmanaged means that you just connect the charger to the vehicle and the charger is working at full power since the moment it's connected until the battery is full and then it stops. So it's basically like not really flexible or not really modulated. It's just like you connect it it charges at full power, and then when the battery cannot take any more power, then it stops. So what we call managed charging is basically to modulate that um, in various ways. Um, and of course, this will depend both on how much power you need to charge, and how much energy you need to sort of refill in the battery, and also how much time you have in what we call the charging window, or how long the vehicle takes. So for example, one form of what we call managed Charging is what you see here on the right, is what we call balance. So basically, if you know for certain uh, how long the charging window will be, um, and if you know how much energy you need to, to refill, so to say, to the battery, then you can define the charging power, meaning the kilowatts or megawatts, so the power unit, uh, to be lower to using all of that uh, charging window to charge the same energy. Um, and I'm sure that the, the, the vehicle driver is happy with the battery level when he or she comes back to take the, the vehicle uh, back. So for example, here in this case, in this chart, we see that the energy uh, charged in most cases will be the same. So the driver would see no difference when they go back to get, get their car or their bus, for example. But for the power system, this can be beneficial because the charging power can be modified uh, with managed charging to reduce the impact on the power grid. So the question that the tool asks itself to see if managed charging is possible and can bring benefits is okay. Do we have some flexibility? So is my charging window long enough to maybe move a bit of that charging emitter to decrease it a bit and spread it over time? And then if there is some flexibility on that aspect, then the tool checks if about the participation rate. So 
is the infra infrastructure adapted? So you can define some parameters in the tool. And also if the drivers are interested and willing to participate in these schemes, because it's not obvious that some drivers will be interested uh, to participate. And then if all of this is a yes, then the tool uh, for each specific uh, vehicle in the simulation, it applies a match charging measure and then you can assess that. So I mentioned that one example of Manap's measure is balanced, basically just spreading out the charging for longer time with a, a lower uh, and co but constant uh, power, well, as you can see here in, in green. But also some other managed or what we call smarter charging measures can be uh, time of use tariffs, which basically is a varying uh, tariff of or the electricity price, depending on the time of the day. Um, so for example, here in this aspect, um, you could see that the way that these tariffs could influence um, the charging is that normally the, the vehicles would uh, try to minimize the total cost of the power, right? So this means that they would try to follow and charge the most whenever the, the, the tariff is lower. So with that, um, the, the, basically, if the tariff is well designed, it can be really useful to try to shift uh, the charging loads of the vehicles and thus to uh, try to decrease the impact on the power system. So now I will go back to the same example I was doing before, so 1,000 cars, but I will apply balanced charging to show, to show you the difference in maximum power demand. So now reset it to start it from scratch. So cars, here, 1,000, I will just leave it there. So if you want to modify the charging scheme, you have to go to the shift called advanced options. So here you can see, okay, I will omit these other uh, parameters here. So balance. So I, as I was saying, I will make now an example with balance charging. So I will, if I want to do that, I have to do it here in under the manage and opportunity charging section specifically when I select this balance the, the, the charging strategy here. So I will just leave all of the other values that by default and show the, the, the difference. So here you see that the peaks uh, compared to the previous case are much less pronounced. So here the, for this 1000 vehicles, we see that the maximum EV power demand over the week is little above 500 kilowatts. Whereas for example, if I go back and just reapply the unmanaged, which is like the default case, the peak goes almost to double, it's uh, almost 1,000. So this shows you that at least this example of measure can be really useful to, to, to decrease um, the impact on the power system in terms of the, uh, the maximum peak power. Um, and in that aspect, it can be really useful to um, as, as a measure to, to reduce the impact of the power system through the use um, of the uh, smarter charging, what we call managed charging. Now, uh, going to the same part, I will show, uh, for example, the impact of time of use tariffs. So, for example, you can go here to select the same part here, time of use. And here, you can also modify in the tool itself uh, what is the credit tariff schedule that you want to simulate. So for example, the base case that you would see here is okay, like a very low tariff during the night time, then it begins to increase a bit during the day. And the default tariff is at its highest, at its highest in the late afternoon or evening, which is normally when the peak power system demand as a complete system happens. So um, here, this is what, uh, for example, it would look like. So now let's look at, at the impact of that on the, on the simulation. Okay, so here is something I, I, I wanted to show because it can be interesting and like uh, it, it can also show that sometimes the trade-offs have to be carefully assessed. Uh, what we see here is actually a bigger peak uh, than before. Um, as you remember well, I showed the, the peak of like the unmanaged case for the 1000 cars was about 950 kilowatts, but now the peak is higher, even if the energy on the whole week is the same. So here, 
uh, why is this important to, to show? So I just wanted to make a point here that the tariff design is very important. Why does this peak happen? If you see here, um, so the, there is a very strong here, a, a strong decline here, like around uh, 10 and, and then 11 p.m. So this means that normally as if the, the vehicles follow the economic rationale, they will try to charge whenever it's the best fit for them, but also considering the cost of charging, which is directly in this case linked to the time of use tariff. So that's causing that because the, 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 the cost is lower at that moment. And it's also when they are in the home to, to charge, that means that uh, that is causing a peak uh, there. So it's important to, if a uh, uh, time of use tariff is inside, it's important to, to, to really try to simulate all of these effects to, to avoid, for example, what we could call, call here a secondary peak of demand of the power system. So this is something like that is really important to, to simulate because of course, um, if the time of use tariff in the end could cause an issue because of the way it's defined, it's not something that uh, probably policymakers would be happy. So this is something that I wanted to show. And it's also something that you can simulate with, with this tool. And lastly, before uh, going to my, uh, my last example, um, I will quickly show uh, D1G. And I will go a bit quickly so to leave more space for questions. But please, if something is not clear, you can ask me later. So as I was saying, D1G is basically one directional vehicle to grid. What it means is that the grid can set signals to the charging infrastructure depending on the demand it's experiencing at a whole grid level. And with that, it can try to accommodate the charging uh, demand of the electric vehicles in particular to try to minimize the whole system demand and thus minimize the stress of the power system. So here again, in advanced options, I select the uh, active control with unidirectional char charging or D1G. And here in Power Grid, you can select, uh, you can see here um, the uh, base power system, the lamp curve. So why is this important? It's because, as I was saying, the D1G is directly connecting the power system and using the power system demand to influence when and how much the EVs charge. So for that, it's essential to have an idea of what is the base uh, electricity demand of the, of the power system without the EVs. So here, you can either upload your own file uh, and also maybe download if you want to have an example file of how the file looks like. But you also can, for example, modify this here in the sliders. So just to make an example, like if I force the, the power system to have a very low demand on weekends, then you will see that the charging with this scheme is lowest on the power systems, like on the weekends. Here. Here. Yeah, so sorry, I think I explained it wrong. So basically, as B1G is following um, the, the, the demand patterns of the power system, and it's trying to minimize the total, meaning power system on its own, plus EV charging, as I was showing here, if the demand is lowest of the power system during the weekends. This is why the D1G scheme would try to accommodate more EV demand on the weekends. Because that way, if the total EV, uh, sorry, the total power system demand is lowest on weekends, but then, um, and you, then, then that leaves more space to shift some of the charging of the week to the weekend. And thus, and that's the optimal uh, place to, to have the, the charging because from the grid point of view, uh, to have more EV charging on the weekend is optimal because there the power system demand is, uh, is lower. So as I was saying here, in the power grid tab, you can modify this as you please, and you can also upload a file to try to uh, accommodate it to your local context and the local data you have for your own jurisdiction. So I will now quickly finish my presentation with a last example of emissions, and then I will open the, the floor for questions. Okay, as I was saying, the last um, part of this uh, uh, motivation of this tool was to estimate the CO2 emissions rate to EV charging. So basically how it works is that uh, the estimate of emissions is produced in the following way. First, the, the simulation computes what is the net load 
meaning the total demand minus the runoffs uh, with and without EV charging to see uh, what is the demand that would need to be met with thermal power plants, for example. So then with the calculation of the net load without and with the EV charging, the simulation runs a simplified uh, power system to run the power plants. And because of these power plants uh, have emissions factors, then we can calculate the emissions uh, cost in both cases, basically the case without and with EVs. And by comparing the emissions uh, related to the power system with and without EV demand, we can assess the emissions that are directly because of EV charge. So here's basically you can kind of see an hourly simulation. So this is a simplified dispatch, meaning that the algorithm is designed uh, to, to minimize the, the cost that uh, the, the, the marginal cost that uh, every hour is simulated. And by that, it computes the optimal dispatch plan, which then, uh, by knowing the emissions factors of each simulated plant, it can calculate the emissions of both with and without EV charging. And by that, calculate the emissions that can be directly caused by uh, EV charging. So now I'm going to show you how it, how it works. Um, I will, for the last time, reset this and go from scratch. So here, let's do the cars example again. And here, and just to mention it briefly, here you can define various parameters of the electricity list because, of course, the power system is really important in, in to define properly to assess properly the emissions. So here you can define, like, for example, the plant type if it's coal or oil or gas. What's like the total capacity of the system? Um, and also here you can see a simulation of the generation mix. So with that. Like if you want to check the emissions values, you just have to, in the results, and it's available for every charging scheme and every other simulation possibility, you will always have this emissions tab available here. So here, how do you see? Basically, you see a, a chart, which you can also download the data for, which is a, a five minutes interval, a chart for the emissions that are directly because of EVs, so marginal emissions from EVs. And you also can have uh, an estimate based on that weekly profile of the weekly emissions and also on the annual emissions. So with this, if you compare the other measures I was showing, you can also compare not only the charging demand between measures, but also the, the emissions that can be caused by, by all of these uh, different measures and maybe have then a different metric to assess uh, how attractive for you is a certain measure versus another one uh, by using the emissions metric, but also, the, as I was saying before, the charging metric. Okay, so with that, let me finish my presentation with some final remarks and then open the floor for questions. So the utilization of road transport is ongoing and it will accelerate as it's contributing to decarbonization and helps reducing dependence on fossil fuels. As I was saying, this will contribute to higher power demand, but at the same time, it can give an opportunity for the power system in terms of flexibility. The power sector can accommodate a wide range of charging solutions, but we think encouraging managed uh, charging is the best way forward. Um, the flexibility of new electricity end uses such as EV charging needs to be incentivized from early stages. And as I showed for a, a, a long amount of time, our tool can be a very useful resource for a wide range of stakeholders, for example, public well, developers, policymakers, system operators, and also utilities and academics. So with that, I finish my presentation and I open the floor for, for questions in the Q&A. Many thanks. So if you will prefer, you can also raise your hand and you can ask the question directly uh, using the microphone. Yes, uh, Atsumasa. Sorry, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting and the very helpful the presentation. Yeah. 
Uh, actually, there is a strong demand of the how to deploy the electric vehicles, specifically the deployment of the charging stations. So my, my question is about the uh, standard of the charging stations. Uh, I recognize that there are uh, the several world standards, uh, including the, the Tesla Tesla charging standard and also the uh, Europe, the Combo, the Japan China demo, and maybe the China also have something. And uh, as far as I observe this year, the Tesla standard is likely the market de facto. So in that sense, can we recommend the Tesla standard as a standard design if we are requested to design the developing member countries, the charging station infrastructure? Hmm. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, so in our case, uh, I mean, this is not my particular area of expertise, but to the best of my knowledge, we don't, at the IA at least, have a specific recommendation on which standard is, is the best. Um, of course, uh, as I was saying in my presentation, there are several benefits of um, having common standards, which because this facilitate, facilitates interoperability. Um, but, but, but as I was saying, to be very specific with you, um, as, as we do not have analysis or uh, our conclusion of if this is the best standard available, then uh, I would not be in a position to recommend uh, to make this standard uh, the, the most, uh, like the, the usual one, over the other ones that, for example, you mentioned correctly that are available in Europe. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, the, what we can uh, suggest to the developing countries is uh, please first to conduct their own assessment of the uh, best of it, the standard for your country. Yeah, I think, of course, I think, I think every country uh, has specific conditions, so I think um, every country, uh, I think well, maybe the best, best way forward would be to carry out their own assessment of which standard would be most adequate for their own context and based on that assessment, decide uh, which uh, standard to, to use. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question uh, written internally. I will read it uh, now. So the question is whether we can conclude that this tool could be used by the policymaker to determine where is the appropriate location to put the EV charging station based on demand and grid availability. So um, I think you can use this tool as an approximation uh, for that uh, purpose. Um, as I was saying, um, I will repeat this, this uh, tool doesn't have a very complex and detailed power system simulation underneath because, of course, every power system has its own complexities, its own design, uh, for example, in terms of uh, trans transmission capacity, congestion uh, risks, for example, and um, stuff like this. So what we do here is just to provide a simple kind of what you would call in the academic literature, the economic dispatch algorithm without accounting for grid constraints or stuff like this, because this would require a deeper study. Um, but with this, you can see, for example, some trade-offs uh, are like some impacts that we would have in terms of supply and demand in mismatch. What you can do, um, for example, uh, I didn't mention it too much, but I, I can also mention it now. What you can do if you, if you want to tailor this for a specific sub area in your country uh, is that you have to define the parameters uh, properly. So for example, if you're thinking of the whole country to make the, this assessment valid for that whole country area, you will need to have information for, okay, for example, the total EV fleet in the country, the total generation capacity in the country. Um, and with that, you can have a simulation that is closer uh, and more adequate to the reality of the country context. But for example, if you want to assess just a city, uh, you would kind of find approximations to do it, for example, by inputting the fleet size and the behavior of just the vehicles in that city, and also try to input the values, for example, for generation capacity that are this like kind of directly linked to that city. So with that, um, you can make an assessment of, for example, okay, what's like the demand you could see for these specific vehicles in this city or uh, this region. Um, and with that, you can, be uh, closer uh, to a simulation of the, the specific local context. I have to remark, as, as I was saying, that um, 
this is useful as a preliminary, uh, uh, like a complex enough uh, simulation in, in, in most cases. But if you really need a, like a detailed uh, study um, where, uh, for example, you also need to account for grid congestion or like some more complex constraints for the power system, uh, or then it, it could be needed to, to complement this tool with other more specific studies uh, that uh, for obvious reasons could go beyond the capabilities of this tool. Because uh, this tool is aimed to help to simulate and, and understand the trade-offs and like maybe to get a dimension of, for example, the charging uh, demand, but to make it reflect um, with a very specific uh, precision, the local context of, let's say, a distribution grid, uh, you would need maybe something extra to complement this tool um, to have an idea. So what you could do with this tool as an input for that later study is you could, for example, as I showed, you can download the data. So you can take the data for the charging profile, for example, in the unmanaged case, and use it as an input for your power system simulation to see how this could impact. And you could, for example, simulate several cases with the tool to get different demand curves, and with that, simulate the power system impact. So that's, I think with that, I should have given you various ideas of maybe how to use this tool to try to uh, simulate a more specific case in your own uh, jurisdiction. Yeah, but thank you for the question. Okay. Yeah, I, I see here a, a question as well, a comment that uh, that person found interesting that we project the uh, high heavy duty vehicles and buses uh, they will make up about one third of the charging demand. Uh, my, apology, my apologies if I didn't mention it, but the chart I showed is at the global level, so not only um the the case of Asia, uh, but it also includes other regions of the world. So maybe this is one reason why uh, you could see that the uh, projection I showed in our scenario it, uh, is different from the measure or the projection you mentioned in the Asian Transport Observatory. Yes, also there's a question by right here. Yes, we will, uh, exactly. Thank you, Jason. We will upload the, the slides after the workshop. Okay, is there any other open question which you would like me to answer? Okay, I think we don't have any more questions. So I will now take the liberty to wrap up the webinar. So I would like to first thank everyone for the participation and your interest and your questions. Uh, we are really happy at the IEA uh, first to have uh, this opportunity for great collaboration with the ADB, but also to have the opportunity to not only present to you our tool for tools, but also to interact with you and get your, your views and your feelings on what we are presenting. Um, as we mentioned before, um, Johanna and James shared a, a survey that they, they would like you to, to please uh, uh, fill uh, in the link that they sent at the beginning. As uh, Jason kindly um, put the, the email there. If you have any question, if you have any feedback, or if you would like to let us know of any important development we should be aware of in your specific uh, jurisdiction, uh, you can email us at the address there, which is jeff.immobility.wg4 at ia.org. Um, and, and yeah, with that, I would love to, to close this. I'm really happy with the outcome of this webinar, and I'm looking forward to, to having more opportunities uh, to collaborate uh, with all of you. Thank you very much. <laughs>